I want to start out this morning by just asking you a very simple question, and you don't have to answer. This is rhetorical. How many of you believe in God? Good. Even the demons believe in God and shudder. I say that because faith being the most important step, obviously, that we have in our relationship with the Lord, it is the foundation. It's the beginning. And, and there's so much more that gives evidence of our relationship with Christ. Um, to believe, to have faith. Faith means to believe in what cannot be seen. Okay? Jesus talked to Nicodemus, and he, and he talked about the wind. Now we, can, we can't see the wind. We see the effects of the wind. It blows our hair. It blows the leaves. It blows the grass. We see those things move. Thus, we know that wind exists because we see the evidence of the wind. But we can't see it. We know it's there. We believe in it with all our heart. We see the evidence. We feel it. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, that's how it is with the Spirit. Okay? We, we don't see the Spirit, necessarily, but, but we see the effects of the Spirit. We, we see the, the change in, in a person's life, and, and we, we feel the effects ourselves of the Spirit's presence in us. Those are the things that, that uh, help us in our faith. Because what we must understand is that all of us will go through seasons of doubt. Okay? Doubt does not cause you to lose your eternal salvation. Okay? It, it, it does not. Doubt's a sin. Okay? There's no doubt about doubt. But the thing about doubt is it's never forever and it never completely destroys. Okay? Doubt is temporary. Doubt is circumstantial. Okay? Faith is eternal. Faith is forever. I'm talking about real faith. And so I want to I talk about the three evidences. We talked about what, what being an overcomer was last week. And we gave uh, several evidences in Scripture of, of of uh, the men in the New Testament, the Old Testament, talking about being an overcomer. I can't remember, though, if I talked to you about the origin of the word so much. So if I, if I did, forgive me, just to, to review, um, the, the word overcomer is, is, is synonymous with conqueror or a victor. And it, it means to be more than a conqueror, to be a super conqueror, to prevail mightily, right? to always endure. It's, it's like this, okay? When, when, when we have faith in Christ, okay, and, and we, we, we actually, in our faith, Christ scores the winning back bus. The win, I'm having trouble speaking this one. The winning bucket at the end of the game in overtime for us, and then we never lose another game we play ever. It's it's sustained. It's done. It's forever. Okay, so overcomer or Hooper Nekeo. Prevail mightily to completely and overwhelmingly be victorious. All right? So I think you get the idea of that. And we talked about the rewards that Jesus promised the seven churches through the seven letters in uh, the book of Revelation. And the, the word that we can remember probably easiest is is by looking down at our feet and looking at the swoosh on our shoe and and nike comes from the word nike and that is to conquer or to prevail um the the military has nike missiles 
All right. Um, it, it, it's the same thing as overcoming or overcomes or, or, or prevailing. But the idea is it's, it's in the present tense, which means it happens now and it continues on forever. It's not, it's not circumstantial. Okay, so your faith in Christ is the beginning of that evidence in your life that you have a true and lasting, forever conquering relationship with Jesus. That's the first step. John, in his epistle that we've been studying, gives several examples throughout the chapters of faith. And, and remember, faith is the foundation. It's the beginning. We have to believe first. Okay. Now, you can, you can say that repentance is common to a lot of people, regardless of whether they have faith in Christ or not. But repentance really doesn't have any eternal significance for the unbeliever. They can repent. They can change. They can do a 180 in their life. But it's not going to make any difference in their eternal destiny. Okay? Just because you go from being a bad person to a good person does not mean that you get to go to heaven. There's only one way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Okay? So... Faith in Christ, that's, that's, that's the beginning. Um, you have to have that. There, there's no other way around that. And what do we believe about Christ? We believe that He is the Son of God. We believe that He is equal to God. We believe that He died on the cross. We believe that He rose from the grave. And we believe He is interceding for us currently at the right hand of God in heaven. Those are the things we believe in about Jesus. Those are some of the things that we cannot concede on when we address brotherly Christians from, from, from other churches. Because there are those that are pretenders. Okay? Oh yes, I believe in Jesus. But the Spirit of God left Him and only the man was crucified. And he, it really wasn't on a cross. It was on a stake. And, and He really didn't rise from the dead. Okay. There, there's a lot of those cults that believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in the deity of Christ. So this is what we believe. John 1, 2 says that the life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. And I think this is very important because we need to realize the Apostle John was with Jesus in that inner circle of three, James, John, and, and Peter. Okay, those, those were the ones that saw things that none of the other disciples did, particularly the transfiguration of Christ. Okay, um, John's telling us, I saw it, I was there, I'm proclaiming it to you. Okay, John gave his whole life up for what he believed. Okay? So much so that he took literal the Great Commission and became a, a, an elder and a teacher of many churches. He, he, was, he was foundation to the New Testament uh, Christian movement. So John is, is telling us, I've seen the evidence firsthand. And then John says, he is, in chapter 2, verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So John is telling us, look, Jesus has made it possible for everyone to be saved. It's not limited to a select group of people. Now, I'm not denying the fact that God has chosen who He has chosen, but that's where free will comes in. That's where our willingness to believe or not to believe comes in, to have faith or not to have faith. And, and John is telling us, He is the atoning sacrifice for sins. He is the propitiation. He is the complete satisfaction of God in all that's required to take care of sins. And He's done it for everyone. John 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That is an extremely strong statement. Okay, Jesus gave up His life for us. 
we ought to be willing to do the same thing for the church. And we are the church. The people are the church. Does that mean that you should die for your brother and sister? Well, God may call you to that purpose, but it's more likely that he's saying, give up your time to help your brothers and sisters who need your help. You know, give up what you're doing to help them. Okay, don't be selfish. Give, freely give. We'll get to that. 318, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. I can tell you that I love you verbally over and over and over again. But if my actions, if, if what I do for you, if, if, if I don't invest my life in you, if I don't share my life with you, my, my words really don't mean anything. They're, they're empty, they're shallow. Okay? But, it, but it's when we come to the aid of each other and, and our neighbors and our family members, that's, that's when the love of Christ is shining for us. Chapter 4, verse 4, John says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Who are the them? The world. The satanic or demonic forces in the world. The spiritual realm of Satan. That's who we have overcome. We've not overcome the people of the world in some physical manner, or we haven't overcome the earth in some physical manner. We have overcome them in a spiritual manner. The spiritual, that's what, the spiritual is what matters. That's why I always talk to you about putting on your, light, your eternal spectacles and living your life through those. Okay? That, that seeing things spiritually. Okay? Futuristically, beyond this life. Verse 9 of chapter 4 says, This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and set His atoning sacrifice for our sins. We were enemies with God. We broke His law. Okay, he is, the, he is the ruler over everything. We broke His law. We were His enemy. But He came into our camp. He came into our territory. He dwelt among us. Now He dwells in us. And who is in us is greater than He who is in the world. So very simply, John sums it up in chapter 4, verse 15. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in, in them and they in God. You have to have faith. You have to confess it with your mouth. You know, sometimes for us, saying something out loud makes it real. Confess things means you own it. When you do something wrong and you confess it, that means you have owned it. You haven't blamed it on someone else. You haven't passed the buck. You haven't ignored it. You have owned it and dealt with it. When you proclaim Jesus as your Lord, you own it. It's yours. You've taken possession of it. Like, just like that present that I re referenced last week, okay? Yeah, it's all wrapped up in a, with a bow in the box, but if, if you don't open up the wrapping in the box, you, you don't know what the present is. So all you got is just a box. So in chapter 5, John addresses faith. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. It goes on at the end of the verse. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's how you overcome, through faith. And faith, unrelenting faith. I chose the word unrelenting 
because it's a continual pursuit. It doesn't mean that you won't fail along the line, but you will never give up. An unrelenting faith produces a sustaining love. If your purpose, if your your motivation is to believe in Christ no matter what, and you live your life that way, it will produce a sustaining love. And I chose sustaining because love that sustains last, even through the hard times, even through the difficulties of life. A sustaining love lasts. And this love is agape love. It's the love that only we can realize because we have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us. Before that, it was just phileo, brotherly love. There's nothing wrong with phileo, but agape is a deep love. It's not eros. It's not intimate. Okay, It's not sexual. It, it, is, it is beyond brotherly love. It's, it's family. All right? that, maybe that's the best way to think of it. Okay? <coughs> When we love with agape love, we love like we're family. Not just acquaintances or friends, or even close friends, but like we're family. I've got your back because you're my sister. I've got, you've got my back because I'm your brother. That's, that's, that sort of thing. Okay? We never let family down. And, and faith produces or sustains love. And John writes about this for us in the book. There's several examples. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. If we obey his word, love for God is made truly complete in them. If we obey his word, we are capable of agape love. Okay, That was chapter 2, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 10. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. And there is nothing in them to make them stumble. If you love your brother and sister, you're no longer in the darkness, groping around blindly. You're in the light. You can see clearly. That's what love does. Chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Listen. It's very simple. If your passion is for things of the world, you need to take a long, hard look at yourself and what's in your heart because your love for the world does not represent your love for God. Jesus says you cannot love God and love mammon. Okay, now a lot of translations say money. What it means is you cannot love God and love stuff of this world. And stuff can be anything. Look at it this way. Whatever you spend the most time on, whatever your interest is in, whatever your passion is in, that's your idol. If it's not God. God first. God first. And we have to work at it, folks. Okay, it's not something that just comes upon us miraculously. It's not something we just do natural because we're still in this flesh. So, I've come across a neat little thing. You probably already know all about it. But if you've got a smartphone, download the Bible app. Okay, and there is tons, literally thousands of five-minute devotional plans. Seven days long, 21 days long, three days long. You know, some of them really moved me, and I copy and paste those suckers and put them on Facebook. And I cannot believe the people that respond. I can believe Jean. She responds to almost everything I put on. Bless your heart. That is an encouragement to me. But listen, there are people that respond to that that I'm going, wow. I know those people. They know me from the past, and they're considering these things. And the, the, the Word of God and, and taking time to, to pray, to read things that inspire us in our relationship with the Lord, those, those are meaningful. Those are things that are purposeful. It's not automatic. We have to work at it. Now, Wendy and I next year will be 25. 
It's come easy for me, but not so much for her. She's very lovable. Not so much me. She's had to work at it. <laughs> All right? She's had, to, she's had to choose to love me even when I was unlovable. That's how it works with love. It, we have to work at it. We can't just assume it. We have to do what's necessary. John says in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. What He's covered you with like a blanket. Any of you have a heavy blanket? A weighted blanket? Oh, uh, I don't. I think Wendy bought one of our cousins a weighted blanket, or one of our nieces a weighted blanket. The first time I got under, I'm like, oh, this is so cool. It's like, you know, when you're in bed and, and it's cold and you want to cover up and you want to feel every part of that blanket around your body, you get a heavy blanket, you've got that right now. And it's just, it's like a stress reliever almost. Okay, now, for those of you that have claustrophobic issues, maybe not so much. But I, I think heavy blankets are cool. And that's what, that's what it is. That's what the great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. How did that happen? How did we become children of God? Because God loved us so much, He poured His love on us. He covered us with the blood of Christ. That's what it took. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. What's the key? Love. Agape, love. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. If you don't love, you cannot be a child of God. If you don't love, there is no evidence of you knowing anything about God. How can you possibly have any kind of relationship with God if you don't show love in your life? There is no evidence. You say, well, I've got a brother that lives out in Oregon and he knows the Lord. Yeah, he knows the Lord, but he hasn't gone to church in, I don't know, seven years. And, you know, he's kind of, you know, says a lot of hateful things about Christians and just has kind of turned his back on his relationship. But, but he knows the Lord. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. We like to tell ourselves that the people we care about have got their lives right where they need to be because... They were brought up in the pews or, or whatever. We, we justify their salvation. We justify their relationship with God when it is not evident at all. And why do we do that? Because we love them. We love them so much that if, if what happened in, in the old Catholic church could still happen today, we, we, would, we would pay for their salvation. That used to happen, by the way, in the history of the church. You could pay for someone that was already dead. Okay, That's how distorted things can become. What we need to do with that person who we say knows God is to reacquaint them, not justify their disbelief and talk about their past when they were raised in the pews, but rather say, hey, listen... You've got to get your life together. Tough love. Tough love is the best form of agape love because it's honest and it's brutal. And sometimes we just have to be honest and brutal. Say, but that's going to hurt their feelings. Yeah. But it's going to keep them from going to hell, maybe. You want to hurt their feelings or you want to allow them to go to hell? Now that sounds pretty drastic. Am I, am I lying? I'm not. I mean, that's the reality. Everything with, everything with God is black and white. You're, you're either a sheep or you're a goat. You're either on the right or you're on the left. There is no gray. Now, that's what the Word tells us. People say, well, what about a deathbed confession? I don't know. I can tell you what the book says, and we've got our entire lives to be obedient 
And I hope I get to that here in a little bit. We got our entire lives to be obedient. So you're disobedient all the way through your life. You don't do what the book says you need to do to get your life straight and have a relationship with God. And on your deathbed, you said, oh God, please forgive me. Now I hope that the grace of God is immeasurably greater than my imagination. But that's not what this book presents to us. His grace is awesome. It's great and it's glorious and it overcomes everything to those who will be obedient, who will have faith, love, and be obedient. You have to have those things. No one has ever seen God, chapter 4, verse 12, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete for us. So let's look at our scripture. It really starts in verse 2. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep His commands. Love's important. Love has to be there. It is evidence of your relationship with God. And most importantly, I want you to just, this is a short verse. John 4, 19. John 4, 19. We love because He first loved us. Can't memorize Scripture? That one's easy. We love because He first loved us. You want to share your testimony with someone? Go to John 4, 19, because you can remember it. We love because He first loved us. And they'll say, what does that mean? And you'll say, I'm only capable of love because God loved me first. Because if I gave in to me, <laughs> I could become as monstrous as a Nazi soldier. That's the reality of the flesh. That's the reality of the world. So, sustaining love, unrelenting faith produces sustaining love, and that produces joyful obedience. We look at those two words and we say, wait a minute, those don't go together. Because obedience isn't joyful. Why isn't obedience joyful? It should be. We talked about this last week. Is there anything in this book that is bad or will cause you problems? No, it's all good. God's commands are all good. They will do nothing for you but good things. But I did it my way, right? That's the tune we like to sing because we don't want anyone telling us what to do. And sometimes, <laughs> more than sometimes, we know better. We just know better. We're in the moment. We have to deal with it. If we don't take care of it now, it'll never get taken care of. Claire says, that's your problem, Dad. Not everything, not everything has to involve conflict. See, I'm a fixer. I can't help it. I told Claire something as she got off the bus yesterday, and she said, you didn't put in your two cents, did you? I said, no, I kept my mouth shut. Because <laughs> I'm starting to learn from my 17-year-old very wise daughter that there are boundaries that should exist and that dad doesn't have to fix everything and he certainly doesn't know everything so the third evidence of a, an existence of a relationship with the lord is obedience joyful obedience so let's start with that because i was going to end with it but it's most important that we start with that God doesn't want your grievance or your grudging obedience. He doesn't want your check that you wrote because you have to. He doesn't want your church attendance because your wife drug you here. He doesn't want that. He wants you to choose to love Him like He chose to love you when you were dead in your sins and trespasses. 
It's a family affair. Do we obey the Father or we do not? Look, I, I didn't make the rules, but God says that the Father in the household is the one who has the say. The problem in our culture is our fathers will not do their job. If the fathers in our culture would do their job, things would be great. We say, wait, that sounds like a dictatorship. No. What does Jesus and Paul say about the role of a father or a husband? They are to love their wives like Jesus loved the church. And what did Jesus do? He made us co-heirs. <laughs> co-heirs. We get to sit on the throne. We're to love our wives like that. Or we're to love our families like that. So we're all responsible for obedience, but dads and fathers and husbands, they've got a double dose. That's just the way God made things to work. Studies have shown that in a household where there is a father and a mother, a child will exceedingly do better to the percentage of 70%. 70% of all children will, will grow happily and be nurtured and become citizens that are, that are what we would call good productive citizens in, in society at a rate of 70% more than those that don't have a father or mother in the home. Now it's interesting that that's 70% because that happens to be close to the percentage of non-traditional families that are represented in our school system. 70% of the kids that go to our school do not have a traditional family. Now I got a question, by the way, um, from someone I didn't know when I posted something on Facebook, they said, well, what do you mean by a traditional family? And I was just able to answer that. You know, a husband and a wife, a traditional family. Okay. Look, there's a lot of grandparents raising children in our community. There's a lot of aunts and uncles raising nieces and nephews as their own children. There's a lot of foster families in this community. All right. And If only we would be obedient. John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. What does it mean to walk in the light? When you, when you go out and it's dark, pitch black dark, do you navigate very well? You can't see. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to go left. You don't know where to go right. You got to feel your way around. When you're walking in the light, when you're obedient to what this book says, you don't have to grope around. Okay, You, you can walk freely, unobstructed. And go your merry way. And the merry, I emphasize merry. He gets, he gets really plain spoken about this in chapter 2, verse 6. And he says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Wowzer. We must live as Jesus did. Pick up your own cross and follow me, he says. And this is His command, to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He commanded us. Wow, there's all three. Faith, love, and obedience in that verse. This is His command, to believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He commanded us. And now, dear children, chapter 2, verse 28, continue in Him so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before His coming. Continue in Him. Now that's an interesting way of saying that. That means, don't just be good now, just don't be obedient now, but continue to be obedient. 
That's why discipline is so important in the home. Now, there are all kinds of different forms of discipline. And I can tell you, children are all different. Some children you can just look at, and that's all it takes. Some children need to have their butt spanked, and that's what it takes. Okay? It's all in this book. <laughs> okay? Both of those things are in this book. Time out. Remove them from the situation. But address it. Why do we address it? So they don't continue to do that. And when we address discipline, we're showing them another way. Being obedient. That's the way to be obedient. And what's, what's the significance? What's the outcome? All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. When you're obedient, you're purifying yourself. Just as Jesus is pure. Jesus had no sin. He, he lived in complete obedience to the Father and His will. That's why He was the propitiation. That's why He was the acceptable atoning sacrifice. Because He had done all that was necessary. Chapter 4, verse 21. And He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. That's big time obedience. Because we give each other all kinds of reasons not to love one another. We just do. Because... That's how we are. That's how we roll. We want to do it our way. We don't put others first. What does John say about obedience? Repeat a little bit, but this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is the love for God to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. And I shared with you this last time, and I just want to do it again. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to Me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for My yoke is easy and My burden is light. Jesus says, if you do it My way... You can rest easy if you do it my way. He's telling us, why are you carrying around that thousand pound backpack of disobedience? Why do you continue to pull against that sled that's loaded with all of your wrongdoing? Why? Do it my way. Do it my way. My burden is light and my yoke is easy. You'll find rest for your souls. How does it feel when you're rested? Are you crabby when you're rested? When you're rested, are, are you mean-spirited? If there is, you need to go see Dr. Harden in Kirksville. Okay, or some other shrink, because there's something wrong up here. When you're rested, the appropriate response to being well rested is just to have that sigh of relief, to, to be able to stand up straight, no pain, no burden, no suffering. When you're truly rested in your heart and your soul, the proper response is love, to, to freely give it, to be joyful in your life. Joyful. His, ban his commands are not burdensome. Let's just look at a few verses. verses. Jesus says in John 14, 15, and He's addressing the, the, the Pharisees who have just heaped all kinds of burdens on the people. Just, just stupid stuff. You know, in order for them to toe the line and to be right with God. If you love Me... Keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. If you love me, 
Keep my commands. Be obedient. Deuteronomy 13.4, this, this is back uh, when the Israelites had escaped Egypt. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and Him you must revere. Keep His commands and obey Him, serve Him, and hold fast to Him. I got to, I got to teach the fifth graders this week uh, flag training. Uh, I took that over from uh, Coach Crawford several years back and promised him I would keep it going. And so I, I take however many sections of fifth graders there are. I, there's two this year. So I took two flags. We bring them all into one room. We show them a video. I help them learn how to fold the flag. I help them learn how to put it up properly and, and retire it properly. And we talk about what the flag means to them. And of course, I get the same answers every year. Freedom, veterans, uh, veteran cemetery, uh, all kinds of answers you would expect, okay? But, but not once, I think this is the fifth or sixth year now, not once have I heard someone say that the flag means reverence. And so I always teach them the word revere. I'm just hoping that someday a little Christian girl or boy will say, oh, like we love God. It hasn't happened yet, but I have hope. But I teach them about what it means to revere, to, to be in awe of something. Okay? When you're truly in awe of something, you're a little bit afraid of it because you don't meet up to it. Right? And, and you revere that. You hold that in high regard. You honor it. That's, that's what to revere means. And reverence is the action of revering. It's what we do in our actions to show that we revere something. You know, when, when we bow in prayer, when we get on our knees and pray, when we hold hands in a circle and we pray, that is revering God. That is showing God reference. Reverence, not reference. Reverence. Okay. Used to, they used to call preachers reverend. I despise that because I absolutely do not be, need to be in awe of. Okay. I'm, I'm a minister, I'm a doulos, a slave. Okay, a servant, just like you all. all right, this, is, this is what God has asked me to do. You've got your own thing. Okay? Jean, Jean's got to go and knit. All right, that's her thing. I could probably pick on all of you, but I'm not going to. Um, Ecclesiastes. I know somebody really likes that book. Uh, chapter 12, verse 13. Now all has been heard... Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, revere Him, and keep His commands. For this is the duty of mankind. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what we're created to do. To follow His commands and show Him reverence. 1 Samuel 15.22, but Samuel replied. What's he replying from? Well, Saul had decided he needed to go ahead and offer a sacrifice before Samuel showed up. And God had told Saul to offer a sacrifice with Saul, or, or with Samuel. And, and what did Saul do? He did it his own way, and thought he was doing good. And Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as he in obeying the Lord? To obey is better to sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. He said, you got it all wrong, Saul. He wants you to do what he says. Not what you think is right at the time. Romans 6.17. I meant to bring my mouse, but I forgot it. Romans 6.17. But thanks be to God that through, through you, used to be, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have now come to obey from your heart, the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. In first century Palestine, when someone was being baptized after confessing their faith in Christ, that meant that they were proclaiming their allegiance to Christ and not Caesar of Rome. Can you imagine that? Living with the thought that just because being immersed in obedience or 
in your process of being saved, just because you're being immersed now made you an enemy of the state? Are we close? Are we close, Christians? What have they removed? What has the state removed? We can't pray in school. The Ten Commandments can't be in the courthouse. What else? Are we becoming enemies of the state? You better believe it. Okay, we're close. We're very close. What Miss Cortez cried when they passed the spending bill to protect the dome. Why? She hates Jews. She hates God's people. It's pretty simple. That'll probably get me. I'll probably get me kicked off of Facebook. That's all right. First Peter five two. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, not because God said so. Oh, I don't want to do that, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Hey, men of the church, don't, don't be overlords, okay? Cheerfully encourage those that are under your care. Show them your positivity in your faith. Encourage them in their faith. And don't extort money from them for crying out loud. That was going on. That's why Peter wrote this. Okay. And then lastly, we all, we all know this one, 2 Corinthians 9-7. Each of you should give what you have decided to give in your own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. All right. This is what I want you to do. All of you have cash in your pocket or checks written. I want you to tear up those checks and double it. And in your cash, I want you to double that cash. Okay, everybody got that? That's what you're going to do, right? And you're all going, wait a minute, that's not, no. If you did that, it wouldn't be because you cheerfully did it. It wouldn't be because that that's what you had decided in your heart to give. It would have been out of compulsion. i got to do it because the preacher said so. If I don't do it, God won't love me. He doesn't need your money. He needs your obedience. He needs your cheerful obedience. God loves a cheerful giver. And it's not just money. He loves you obeying Him because you love His laws. Because His laws are good. You all read Psalm 119 this week. Longest book in the Bible. Over and over and over. The psalmist praises Loving God's law and His decrees and His statutes and His ordinances so much so that He says He sings about it. The popular songs of today are only about disobedience to God. The popular songs of today are only about disobedience to God. Do I listen to them? Yeah, I'm afraid some of them I do. Why? They got a good beat. Mm. Justify that stuff, right? That's how we do it. God wants us to be obedient to Him as much as we possibly can. Look, you and I are going to go out this door and we're going to fall flat on our face. We're going to stub our toe. We're going to get hit with the tractor right in the chest. Things are going to happen to us how we react to them and our attitude after, whether we glorify the miracle or not, those are the things that matter to God. Those are the evidences of loving God, being obedient to Him, testifying to our faith. That's what God wants. You know, Nick could have said, man, this really hurts. Why did you do this to me? Shot another way. The way it should be seen. Okay, a um, long time ago, my nephew Colton was riding with his dad in the tractor, playing with the toys on the floor. Next thing you know, Colton's not there. 
The evidence of what happened to him were tire marks all across down his face and his eye going completely red bloodshot and swollen. Should have died. He didn't. He didn't. God spared him. Now, I don't know how that's going to work out. We'll see. Colton's a young man. We'll see what kind of life he lives and what kind of glory he gives to the Lord through how he lives his life. Y'all you all know the, the saying about having your 15 minutes of fame. To me, that is, I, I look at that differently now that I'm a Christian than I do as when I was in the world. When I was a little kid and thought worldly, okay, thought like a child thinks, I thought about being a great football player, baseball player, and being famous. Now I think more about what's that moment going to be where God gives me the platform to glorify Him and people draw nearer to Him. That's the 15 minutes of fame I think about now. It, it becomes less about us when, when we have unrelenting faith, sustaining love, and joyful obedience. It becomes about the Lord. And that's how we should live our lives, and that should be the evidence in our life that we have a relationship with Him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Your Word this morning, and we're grateful for what it means to us. We all have choices to make, Father whether we obey you or whether we don't. We all know that we're going to fail in complete obedience. We already have. There will still be problems that will occur that will be our own doing. And that does not give us doubt. That gives us an opportunity to praise you for what you have done for us through your Son and made us overcomers of all those wrongdoings. It's amazing the love you have for us, Father, the heavy blanket that you spread over us, that grace that you give us. We don't deserve any of it. Truly, we are fleshly beings full of selfishness and want and envy and lust. Give us strength, Father, to fight against those things. To be Christ-like in all we say and in all we do. We open up our mouths and sometimes the most hateful things come out. Or, in my case, the most inappropriate things. Help us to realize those moments, Lord, and to just be quiet and not say anything. Sometimes, Father, we open our mouths and we just make the, the, the moment worse. We, or we sustain the moment longer than it should. We need to be careful with our words, Lord. And then we need to be careful with our actions because they mean so much more. And people call us hypocrites because we say one thing and we do another. It's the do another part that's the problem. We, we can profess and confess and proclaim all we want, but if we don't show love to back up our faith, if we're not obedient to your word, our profession, confession of faith is not very strong. And certainly not very persuasive. So Lord, help us to be joyful Christians. Joyful followers of Christ. Always realizing that you have our back and that you see us through every moment. If we would just listen and do what you tell us to do. Father, at this time we are going to observe one of the commands that Jesus gave. To remember his death. To remember that he had to suffer so that we don't. Help us to be reverent during this time. To set our minds right and our hearts right. To give up on the stresses of the week and the stresses that are going to occur. 
and just focus on this moment and give Jesus credit where credit is due. We love you, Father, so much. And we're so thankful for Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.